Welcome to Bob's Last Marathon, where Lena Chow Kuhar shares her first-hand experiences and practical wisdom gained from caring for her husband, Bob, on their long, unmapped journey with Alzheimer's disease. Through her own insights, as well as those of other caregivers, advocates, and experts, Lena hopes to help you meet the challenges of Alzheimer's disease and give your loved ones the best quality of life possible. In a recent expert roundtable on Alzheimer's caregiving, three leaders in the field shared their thoughts on where we are with Alzheimer's disease today. In this excerpt from the roundtable, Dr. Jason Karlowish identifies the gaps in America's support system for people with dementia and the families caring for them and points out policy initiatives that are critically needed. Dr. Karlowish is Professor of Medicine, Medical Ethics and Health Policy and Neurology at the University of Pennsylvania and co-director of the Penn Memory Center. His most recent book, The Problem of Alzheimer's, How Science, Culture and Politics Turn a Rare Disease into a Crisis and What We Can Do About It is now available in paperback. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My colleague, Steve Arnold, talked about how we've made and we will continue to make some path-breaking and even spectacular advances in developing better diagnostics and especially better therapeutics, particularly the therapeutics that target the mechanisms of the diseases. And I can identify the patients who are most likely to respond to those therapies. So what does that mean? Well, we should expect that Alzheimer's disease is becoming a treatable disease. In the words of pharma, they would call it a druggable disease. But we shouldn't expect that every cause of disabling cognitive impairments will be treatable, certainly not curable. Stephen said that, and I'm reiterating the point. Not everyone is eligible for the drugs that have been developed, and the findings from research over the last 20 years, 30 years, has been heterogeneity, namely that the typical person with Alzheimer's has not just Alzheimer's pathology, but other pathologies. So there's a real policymaking implication to that, which is we are going to have to learn how to live with disabling cognitive impairments, or in a word, how to learn to live with dementia, disabling cognitive impairments. We may slow for some patients uh, the course of their disease, perhaps for some completely arrest it, but we need to live with the fact that we will have to live with dementia. So let's talk about that. How can we set up a society in America that allows us to live well with dementia. I think we can break this into two parts. First, how will persons living with dementia and their caregivers carry on with their life, in particular with benefiting from the kind of interventions and supports that Felicia Greenfield described? And second, how will persons living with dementia die of it? Let's first start with living with the disease. Felicia explained that we have the means to make these diseases livable. For both patients and for caregivers, we have what's known as long-term care services and supports. That's what she described. But those aren't routinely available. In America, we have a federally funded social insurance program for health care. It's called Medicare. And in the Medicare statute signed into law in 1965 by President Johnson, there is an explicit list of items of interventions that Medicare does not cover. They include hearing aids, plastic surgery, and custodial care. Now, in 1965, that was the term used to describe the care that someone gave to another person who was disabled from an illness. Custodial care. Think about that, what that word suggests. It's as if the person is a building to be swept and mopped, etc., not a person who needs care. But that was the way we thought about it back then. It was custodial care, and the statute explicitly prohibits it. So long-term care services and supports are not supported by Medicare. Medicare supports hospital-delivered services and outpatient-delivered services. It supports the delivery of medical care. So for example, Dr. Arnold talked about some spectacular diagnostics and therapeutics that are coming out. Those may be covered by Medicare. There's been debate about that, but I expect that they will be. But the kind of services that Felicia Greenfield talked about are not routinely provided. Indeed, at our memory center, access to people like Felicia and her colleagues is available, but it's made possible by a generous gift 
from a grateful patient's spouse. Without that donation, we couldn't provide the long-term care services and supports that are the standard of care after diagnosis. Put another way, if we relied on Medicare billing to support our memory center, we would not be able to provide the services and supports that are so essential. And again, I'm very encouraged about the prospects of treatments that will slow the progress of the disease, but that will only extend the period of time that people need long-term care services and supports. We're not going to drug our way out of the need to care, and so we're going to have to face that as a society. Right now, access to social insurance for long-term care services and supports is made possible on a state-by-state basis through Medicaid. Not Medicare, but Medicaid. Medicaid is a means-tested program, though, where you have to qualify for certain poverty thresholds in order to receive the supports. It also varies from state to state how much support is available. And frankly, because of legal matters that are accepted, essentially long-term care services and supports through Medicaid are rationed when the funds run out at a state in a given year. I think a lot of what we're witnessing with supports for caregiving in America reflects that term that was in that Medicare statute, custodial care. At the same time that America committed to paying for medical care, it was unable to even conceptualize what it means to provide care for someone who is disabled. Indeed, the word caregiver wasn't even used in the English language lexicon at that time. It was not until the 1980s that we began to use the word caregiver to describe that person who essentially supports the mind of another person whose mind is being transformed by a disease. The concept of caregiving is as old as the Bible. In the book of Ruth, Ruth is is cared for by her daughter-in-law, Naomi. And yet nowhere in the book of Ruth is she called Ruth's caregiver. She's just a good daughter-in-law doing what good daughter-in-laws do when their mother-in-law has no one else to care for them. I thought that the pandemic would make us realize how important humans are to care for other humans. Because as we all know, when humans were put into lockdown and taken away from access to visitors in long-term care residential facilities or visitors in hospitals, that we would realize that not all visitors are visitors, that they're essential mind support for a damaged mind, much like elecanumab is a support for the mind that's damaged by beta amyloid plaques. I thought that after the pandemic that we would realize that we need to support America's caregivers, but that hasn't happened. In the language that was drafted after the pandemic, the uh, Inflation Recovery Act or whatever Biden called it, there was clear support to expand the wages paid to providers of long-term care services and supports, but that was rapidly lined out in negotiations and was never part of the act. And so we never have made any progress in expanding long-term care services and supports. And this matters because the hours spent caregiving are the argument for why this disease is such a problem. The triple-digit billion-dollar cost of Alzheimer's in America, of dementia, is not the cost of providing medical care. It's taking the hours that a spouse, a daughter, and rarely a son spend caring and putting a wage on it and then calculating the wages spent by America's families caring for a family member disabled from dementia. These wages are wages that are not available for other things a family needs, like paying for a college tuition. These wages cause people to have to be out of the workforce and therefore not paying into social security or advancing in their jobs. So America is paying for long-term care services and supports, but it's the American family paying out of their strained pocket that's doing this. What it will take is amending Medicare to uh, expand its coverage for long-term care services and supports. This isn't a radical idea. In Japan, Germany, and in the Netherlands, long-term care services and supports are backed up by the government. Germany has had a system in place for over 25 years, paid for by a payroll tax. It's solvent and it works, and it keeps the German family from the fiscal threat that they would face when a family member is diagnosed with dementia. So we can do this, we just have to muster the political will. We also have to recognize that for persons living with dementia, the theory of at home is best has to be questioned. Increasingly, over the last decade or so, Medicaid has directed its funds towards what are known as home-based, community-based services and supports in the home. This means that they'll provide support for a family member to give care in the home. But sadly, as we know in this disease, there comes a time when home is no longer working person being at home is lonely, 
The person caring for them is overwhelmed. And a residential setting with experts in how to care for people with damaged minds is what's needed. But unfortunately, the trend in America is to not provide good quality residential care. Indeed, the nursing home has become a dreaded place and also an industry used by venture capital in order to simply make money, not to deliver care. So we need to really rethink what it means to have residential long-term care. Finally, we need to think about, in the beginning of the disease, the laws that we've set up to support someone to exercise their autonomy. Right now, you're either competent or capable, or you're not competent and not capable. That's the way the law envisions things. For the vast majority of people living with these diseases, they have marginal capacity. They're able to make decisions, but they need someone else to support them. That's oftentimes the caregiver. But we don't recognize the role of the caregiver in the law to help people make decisions. There's a concept known as supported decision-making developed in the world of disability rights that allows an adult to be designated as the supporter for another adult to help them make decisions. This isn't a guardianship. It doesn't strip the rights from that individual, but it recognizes for financial matters, for medical matters, that this other person should be there and be part of the decision-making process. This could go a long way to support the lives of persons with MCI or mild stage dementia. Finally, I'll close with a somewhat dark topic of it's all very well to know when to start the treatments that Dr. Arnold talked about, but when should we stop them? And after we stop those treatments, how should we care for someone? Hospice benefits are limited to people who have six or fewer months of life left to live. Prognostication in dementia is extremely difficult to know how long someone has to live. Many a time when I've referred one of my patients to hospice, the family will say to me, gosh, I wish we had access to this earlier. Why not? And I unfortunately have to say to them, we're lucky to have gotten it when you got it, given the controversies of access. So we need to rethink what palliative care is for this disease when, as we say, the mind oftentimes is more damaged than the body and palliative care is needed. I thank you for this opportunity to talk about some of the policy initiatives that are needed, expanding access to long-term care services and supports, recognizing the role of supported decision-making, rethinking and revolutionizing residential long-term care. These are things that we can do. We know how to do them. We just have to muster the political will to do them. Thank you, Dr. Karwish. We have a very engaged audience and lots of questions are coming in. One of them is, how do we improve residential care? Where do we begin? Number one, we need to really rethink the financing that surrounds nursing homes. There's huge conflicts of interest in uh, nursing home ownership. Owners of the nursing home also will own the businesses that supply the nursing home. In a sense, for many corporations, nursing homes have become just simply real estate ventures. That's what they're there for. So we really need to re-scrutinize the business models that surround nursing homes. More generally also, memory care units are often embedded in assisted living facilities. I have no fundamental problem with assisted living, except assisted living sort of operates on a state-by-state ad hoc basis. There are some really good models out there for developing residential settings for individuals living with dementia. I think the greenhouse model is a good example of how architecture and staffing can be thoughtfully deployed to create a space that allows an individual's mind to be supported. But this just requires the recognition that the kind of sort of hospital ward design that we have for residential long-term care just simply doesn't serve a mind that needs support. So those are all steps that we can do, reforming the regulations, the financing structures, and embracing, frankly, the building of facilities that adhere to the kind of principles developed by programs like the Greenhouse Program. There is a follow-up question. I'm not aware that a U.S. payroll tax to pay for LTS has ever been legislatively proposed. Is it realistic that it will be? The last effort in the United States to create a system of long-term care services and supports was in the 19. 19- 80s, the 1988 uh, presidential election, and every single candidate lined up in support of creating a, an essentially a Medicare-style benefit for long-term care service supports paid for out of a payroll tax, because you have to have a tax that essentially covers everyone who is going to tap into a widely spread risk, hence payroll tax is a, a good model. Long-term care 88 never became statute because there was one candidate who just wouldn't come down in favor of it. And that was uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. He, of course, would go on to win the election. 
Since then, the political climate has been one that has never advanced any significant legislation to address this. The Class Act was buried in the Obamacare Act, but it was widely recognized from the moment it was written that it was actuarially unsound and essentially died even after passage. So uh, let me do give you a bleak statement. One half of the American political system, if you look at it by the parties, has come down plainly saying that raising taxes is an anathema and we won't do it. And so as long as you have a political party simply saying any increase to increase revenue is a non-starter, you pretty much have a non-starter for addressing the problem through taxation, which is disappointing. Thank you for listening to this excerpt from our expert roundtable on Alzheimer's disease, where we are today. Transcripts of today's show and other episodes and acknowledgments can be found at bobsmarathon.com. That's Bob's Marathon without an apostrophe. Send us a note with your comments, like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We wish you and your loved ones good health. <laughs>